Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us this morning for the Ludeman Family Center for Women's Health Research Training with Dr. David Schwartz. I'm Judy Reigensteiner, Distinguished Professor of Medicine and co-founder of the Ludeman Center. The Ludeman Center has been part of the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus since 2002. Um, we have a three-part mission to conduct the groundbreaking research in women's health and sex differences, particularly in the areas of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and mental health that integrates with physical health. Then also to train the next generation of researchers in women's health and sex differences and to educate our community as well. We founded this center on the premise that women's health had long been excluded, leaving a large gap in knowledge in medicine. We offer, we offer monthly training opportunities to our faculty, people, young scientists, early career scientists who are supported by the center, and we expanded this particular session to the School of Medicine faculty. You'll receive a survey link in the chat as well as in an email to complete an evaluation at the end of today's session. Please complete the survey as it helps us in planning for further sessions. Today's session entitled Writing a Persuasive Hypothesis and Specific Games is led by Dr. Dr. David Schwartz, Distinguished Professor, Medicine Pulmonary Sciences and Critical Care Physician. Dr. Schwartz served as the Robert Shire Chair of Medicine between 2011 and 2021. He has made numerous contributions towards understanding the role that biological and genetic determinants play in the onset of diseases that are influenced by the environment. His lab is extremely well-funded, which is one of the reasons we invited him to speak today, because he's a master grant writer. and. Uh, He's a very talented scientist. We are honored to have Dr. Schwartz speaking with you today. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. He has asked, Dr. Schwartz has asked that we have a open question and answer. So if you have questions, please go ahead and ask them and Dr. Schwartz will respond during his talk. Anyway, thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. We appreciate your participation today. Great, thanks, Judy. Thanks for the invitation and congratulations on the center and the progress that the center is making uh, for women and for the greater campus. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to really have this function as a workshop. Um, and um, workshops function best when everyone uh, tries to interact with each other and ask questions and uh, provide their um, their views uh, of how to do this, um, how, how to do something bet better. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is not only the specific aims and hypothesis, but um, actually the entire grant. Um, and I'm gonna give you my views of how I think um, you uh, should, um, should write a grant. Um, or how I go about writing a grant. Um, um, but I know that there are lots of other opinions uh, among uh, the people that are out in the audience. And, um, and I know that there are varying levels of expertise uh, uh, for the people in the audience. Uh, and so I, I really want this to be an interactive session. Don't hesitate on micing yourself and asking a question. Um, Okay, so um, let's see if I can get this to function properly. Um, uh, uh, I'm hoping that you're seeing basic elements of NIH grants uh, on your slide. Um, the important point of this is really the subtitle, which uh, tells you that the NIH actually has a lot of resources uh, for you to uh, learn from. Uh, they want you to be successful. Everyone at the NIH wants you to be successful. In fact, their bottom line, how they get measured, how the program officers get measured in terms of their, um, their productivity and, um, and uh, their metrics is uh, related to how successful the people are that are applying through their particular area of expertise. We'll get back to that at the end of this when I uh, tell you uh, how I've interacted with the NIH. And, um, but, um, but that subtitle of uh, going to the NIH website for resources is, is very, very important. Okay, so let's start with the specific aims. <clears throat> 
And um, I'll give you my view of what you're trying to transmit in the specific aims. And then I'm gonna show you specific examples. And then I'm going to open it up for discussion. Okay, so uh, while I'm presenting, think about uh, the concerns, questions, and issues that you have in terms of writing specific aims. Uh, uh, what I'll start off by saying is that um, my view is that the specific aims page is the most important page that you write. Um, and uh, my view also is that I take the longest time to write the specific aims page uh, than any other uh, part of the grant. And um, I, I kind of think of the specific aims page almost as an architect's plans that dictate the way the rest of the building or the house is gonna be constructed. Without the architect's plans, without the conceptual thinking in the specific aims page, the rest of the grant is uh, becomes somewhat meaningless. So what I hope to get across in the specific aims is a, a sense of excitement uh, for the, the, the project that I'm, I'm, I'm putting forward. I, I, I really want the reader to understand uh, what I'm trying to do really easily and to be excited by what I'm trying to do, not to fall asleep during uh, the reading of the specific games page. So it has to be very readable. It has to be very transparent. It has to um, catch the imagination of the reviewer. Um, catch the imagination of the reviewer. That's a really important concept. You almost have to have the reviewer think the way you're thinking at the end of the specific games page, not uh, in conflict with the way you're thinking. Second is I want to make sure that the reviewer understands why this research is so important, uh, how uh, this research is going to advance the field. And I've, I've recently put things in the context of an unmet need. And uh, you know, an unmet need um, uh, is hard to deny if you can convince them that it's an unmet need. Um, and, in clinical medicine, we have a huge number of unmet needs. I mean, you go to the patient's bedside, and whenever I take care of a patient, I recognize how much we don't know. And I think, you know, COVID has humbled us repeatedly and told us how much we don't know about taking care of patients. And those are unmet clinical needs. There are also unmet biological needs. There are unmet public health needs. There are unmet needs in a variety of domains. And what you need to get across, or what I think you need to get across in the specific aims is what unmet need are you addressing? The third is, um, is why you? Why should they give you the money uh, rather than someone else? And um, I always uh, go back to like what I've done that is particularly relevant to that particular question that I'm trying to answer, that particular hypothesis that I'm trying to address. Um, uh, and, um, and the idea is that I will go back to what I've done and pick little snippets of what I've done that, um, that relate to the theme of what I'm trying to do in the future. That tells the reviewer why I'm particularly uniquely qualified to move forward uh, with that particular area of research. You want to get across a hypothesis um, that's uh, both innovative and I, I, you know, the word innovative is used way too frequently these days. Um, but I, I think that um, I think that what I'm trying to say here is that this is not a hypothesis that's just incremental or redundant with what's out there in the field, but this is something new, something that hasn't been addressed before. Something that is multi-dimensional, but not too complex. You don't want the reviewer to 
have to think about what are they trying to do in this grant. You want the reviewer to understand the hypothesis and the importance of the hypothesis. Specific aims are um, you know, self-explanatory. You want them to understand what the plan is to address the hypothesis. Uh, and lastly, you want them to understand what the impact of the work is gonna be. Um, it's always the so what. <clears throat> I've had a lot of, um, uh, I've had, I, I, I've, I've been really fortunate to have a lot of trainees. Um, and so I work on grants with a lot of my trainees and oftentimes they're so in the weeds about what they're comparing and how they're comparing it and what they're thinking about in the details of the assays or the details of the patient population that they forget to remind the reviewer that, um, that there's gonna be an impact uh, to the field if they fund this work. And so, you know, to do all of this in one page is pretty onerous. Um, and that's why I'm, that's why for me, at least, it takes me about two weeks to write a specific aims page. I keep going back to it, keep going back to it. I, I find that the first iteration is so complex that I don't even understand it. Um, and by the time I get to the last iteration of it, you know, everyone understands it, See, even people who aren't involved in science. Um, and, and that's what I want, uh, that's what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for a real user-friendly kind of specific aims page that's not too cluttered um, uh, and gets across all of these issues in one page. And I think that once I write this specific games page, I could turn the specific games page over to someone else and they could write the grant. That's how that's how um, uh, um, important the specific games page is to the conceptual and practical approach uh, to grant writing. So let me give you an example and then I'm going to open it up to discussion. So this is a typical, uh, and, and I want you to know, I, I want you to know that this is completely formulaic, okay? This, took me um, years to develop and, and it took years to develop um, this formula um, as a result of reviewing other people's grants, as a re result of really looking at other grants that um, uh, did well in the review process. After thinking about the critical elements as a, as a reviewer of trainees grants, um, and, um, and as someone who has had a number of grants um, not funded by the NIH, thinking through why they weren't funded by the NIH. Okay, so let me give you an example and then we'll open it up to questions. So what I like to do is uh, set the tone in the first sentence of the grant. And I like to set the tone in the first sen sentence by trying to create a simple bolded sentence of what's the goal of this particular grant. And I do that in this overall goal. I want it to be understandable and I want it to be exciting. So the overall goal of our proposed research is to understand how long non-coding RNAs, link RNAs, impact the effect of common idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis risk variants on transcriptional profiles and the clinical severity of IPF. Now that's a little bit complex, right? Um, it's, it's a, it might even be a little too complex. So what I do then is I try to create a figure that, um, that, um, that illustrates this concept complex, this concept, this complex concept in, uh, in a visual that anyone can understand. So here are the risk variants for IPF. Here are the IPF transcriptomes that occur as a result of these risk variants. And what I want, and then there are these clinical subtypes that emerge from the, uh, from the transcriptome, uh, the individual transcriptomes that are initiated. And then I'm 
telling them that this is all controlled by link RNAs. And that's why link RNAs are so important in this proposal. So, you know, sometimes this overall sentence isn't as simple as I'd like it to be. And so I, I add a figure to help the reviewer um, move through this quickly, easily, and in an understandable fashion. And, and I think in this particular grant that was funded, uh, these link RNAs in this first sentence become the focus of the grant and become important regulatory molecules in terms of regulating the transcriptome, regulating the clinical and pathologic phenotypes of IPF, and all embedded in what are the risk variants that are important in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, so that's all in the first sentence and the first figure. Second uh, is I want them to understand the importance of the research. So these findings suggest that IPF is a heterogeneous disease. I want them to get you know, get the fact that, that we're talking about a clinical problem that's quite heterogeneous across these different phenotypes. And it's dictated by these molecular signatures, these individual molecular signatures. And that the determinants of genetic and molecular subtypes of IPF will provide essential clues to disease pathogenesis, prognosis, and treatments, treatment and survival, all of which remain major problems in understanding and treating patients with IPF. Okay, so you know that sort of addresses an unmet need, which is these issues, the pathogenesis, prognosis, treatment, survival of IPF are all suboptimal right now and really need a lot of attention. Why me? Okay, so I say in the past five years, and then I go on to, to and I, I can talk about the specifics, but we don't need to. I, I, I tell them what, what we've done in our laboratory in the past five years to make us experts in understanding this relationship between IPF, its risk variants, its uh, transcriptome, uh, uh, the, you know, the various transcriptional signatures and uh, clinical and pathological uh, subphenotypes of IPF. And that's essentially what I tell them uh, that we've done in the past five years. So within the first paragraph, they understand what the overall goal is. They understand the importance of the research and uh, they have, uh, they, they bonded with me as someone who can do this uniquely um, uh, in, uh, in terms of my uh, specific areas of expertise and, and uh, various accomplishments that we've had. The second paragraph. I view the second paragraph as sort of um, a point of tension, a point of, um, of, of, of critical um, a transition. And, and what I mean to do here is I mean to say, although we've done all of this, there's a big problem in the field. And, and, and this is what we're trying to address. Okay, so I started out, despite our recent progress in understanding the protein coding genes in IPF, there's no clear explanation for the molecular clinical heterogeneity of IPF. So all of a sudden I create tension for them. You know, the first paragraph is a, a feel good paragraph. The second paragraph is, hey, there's a problem here and, and we're going to address this problem. Okay, so here's the problem to be solved. Um, and I talk about you know, the relationship between the, um, the low penetration. Well, um, what I say basically is that, you know, although we've discovered this really dominant genetic factor in pulmonary fibrosis, it has a low penetrance. And, um, and there are other IPF risk variants 
And this ends up being a rare disease, even though this is a common risk variant. Importantly, emerging findings suggest that link RNAs could alter the impact of genetic risk variants by influencing the molecular machinery that leads to IPF and in turn account for pathophysiologic phenotypes of IPF. So I tell them what the problem is in that first sentence. And then I, you know, I don't like make them depressed. I give them a solution to that problem that we're uh, going to study in this particular um, in this, in, in this particular proposal. <clears throat> and then I make it abundantly clear that we're going to do something novel here. Um, and uh, so based on these observations, we postulate that the etiology and severity of pulmonary fibrosis will be best understood through an integrated approach that accounts for inherited factors and in turn their influence on coding and non-coding transcriptome, something that's never been done before. In terms of the hypothesis, I make it multi-dimensional, but I don't want them to think very much. I, I really want it to be as clear as possible. So what I say here is that we're hypothesizing that link RNAs regulate the effect of common IPF risk variants on transcriptional profiles that drive the development and clinical severity of IPF. Again, it, it gets back to that initial sentence, but it puts, you know, it, it articulates it in terms of a hypothesis and it relates very much to that uh, figure that I showed you uh, previously. So what's, what are the characteristics of a sound hypothesis? That it's grounded in existing knowledge and theories, that it expresses a relationship uh, between measurable variables. You have this cause and effect relationship that actually is part of a temporal relationship. So you have the genetic variants, transcriptional profiles, and uh, the clinical uh, phenotypes and you have link RNAs uh, controlling or regulating uh, those outcomes. And that's a temporally involved uh, process. The hypothesis needs to be unambiguous and novel, and it needs to be feasible and amenable to testing. And you're addressing an unmet need and you should be explicit about what unmet need you're addressing. And that's one of the things that I did not include in the specific aims page. But if I were rewriting it, um, uh, I, I would include in the specific aims page. And, and people who write grants with me, I should just say parenthetically, always get annoyed at me because every time they send me a version of the specific aims, I revise it again and again and again and again. And I would I would revise this specific AIMS page just looking at it right now. Okay, um, so the specific AIMS are pretty straightforward. I think it's important to keep them simple and to keep them understandable and to keep them in, in declarative. Um, I did this session once with David Bentley, who is an RNA biologist and um, does great work with RNA and is a friend and a colleague. And he said that oftentimes what he'll do in the specific aims is he'll, he'll add the question that they're trying to answer um, in each one of the specific aims. And I started to do that intermittently. Uh, I haven't done that, uh, I haven't incorporated that. So I didn't really put that in as one of the approaches that I take, but he finds it to be very helpful. He finds it uh, as a way of kind of leading the reviewer into his thinking of, of what, what kind of question he's trying to answer. Other people um, put um, hypotheses in each one of these specific aims. I don't like that very much. Um, and uh, I don't like that because I think it, it slows the reviewer down and it makes them think about how that hypothesis relates to the bigger hypothesis that they're trying to uh, study in, in the grant. And um, so um, 
I don't like that when uh, one of my trainees does that, and I don't like, or colleagues uh, do that, and I don't like that when I have to review a grant that does that. But, um, you know, to each his own, and I think that if that's something that you do and feel like it's important to do, um, I wouldn't necessarily stop doing that because I, you know, I see it in a lot of grants. <clears throat> I think that when you, when I think about specific aims, um, I think about um, including state-of-the-art science. Um, and I, I, I think about that a lot because as I get older, I get further and further away from state-of-the-art science. And uh, that requires that I collaborate more and more. And, uh, and I really enjoy that collaboration and I really enjoy understanding what the what what the latest technology is to approach a particular question that I have. And uh, while I like coming up with the questions, um, I sometimes am not as tuned in to the uh, most state of the art technology uh, to approach that question. And that's where I, I rely heavily on collaboration and uh, co investigators and MPIs. Uh, that participate in uh, the research uh, that uh, are that I'm um, proposing. I um, I think it's important uh, that each one of these aims be independent, but they're part of a progressive um, acquisition of knowledge that um, that um, gives a whole picture to this. They can't be so independent that they're not part of the, they're not all are addressing uh, a, a component of the hypothesis. So I would say that although they're independent, they're dependent in terms of knowledge development and progression. And then I always aim uh, to uh, finish the specific aims with a, a, a paragraph and a specific sentence that talk about the impact of the work. Uh, the end result will be an enhanced understanding of the novel genes, regulatory pathways and networks and molecular mechanisms involved in the etiology and clinical severity of IPF. Okay, so uh, really what you, what, what, what I'm thinking about when I write the specific aims, and this is why it takes me so long to write the specific aims, is how is the reviewer going to respond to these specific aims? Not like how smart am I and, and how good are my colleagues and how complex is this idea and, um, and, and all that kind of stuff that we, we normally kind of think, try to think through. But, but really, I continually put myself in the reviewer's shoes and, and say, well, if, if the reviewer is reading this at 11 o'clock at night or at six in the morning or on a plane ride uh, somewhere, um, what is, you know, how are they going to respond to the specific aims? And, and what I, I want them to do is to be excited by the work, to understand the importance of the proposal, to know that I can do it and I'm uniquely qualified to recognize the innovation of the hypothesis, to think that the plan is feasible and to know that successful completion of the proposal will have an impact on the field. These are all the elements that I keep asking myself while I'm writing and rewriting and rewriting uh, the specific aims. And I might rewrite the specific aims, you know, 10, 15, 20 times. Uh, it's not just uh, a quick run through in terms of the specific aims. And the bottom line is that I want the reviewer at the end of their reading of the specific aims to become an advocate of my work. They haven't worked too hard to understand my perspective. So in other words, at the end of the specific aims, it was an easy read for them. They're excited about the work and they're gonna advocate for me in the study section. Okay, um, so let me just uh, go 
back to that and open it up for questions and comments about the specific games. You must have different opinions. I know that all of you are really experienced in writing grants and it would be good to like share your perspective and, and give us your opinion in terms of what works, what doesn't work, um, uh, what, what resonates with you. Uh, Jill Carr, you're- yeah. Hi. Can you introduce yourself, Jill? I don't know you. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Jill Carr. I am in pediatrics um, and endocrinology, and I'm also director of research um, for ROCS in the Center for Children's Surgery. Um, I I, it's the first time I ever heard someone say not to put hypotheses in a AIMS page. And so I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about that. Is it, you know, maybe dependent on the grant agency? Is it maybe the field of study or what other factors um, need, we need to weigh in um, to make that decision of including hypotheses versus not? Yeah. So, um, Great question. Let me just go back to this. Um, I do put a hypothesis in the specific games page for sure. Okay, so, but this is the overall hypothesis. I don't put a hypothesis in each one of the specific games. And, um, and David Bentley, puts a question in each one of the specific games that he's addressing as a opposed to either a declarative statement or in conjunction with a declarative statement. Um, the reason that I don't like a hypothesis within each one of the specific games as opposed to an overall hypothesis is that putting a hypothesis in each one of the specific games forces the reviewer to begin to think about, well, how does that hypothesis in that specific game relate to the larger uh, uh, hypothesis of the proposal? And how does that hypothesis in the specific game relate to the other hypotheses in the other specific games? And I just think it slows the reviewer down and it makes them think a, a little too much as they're reading the grant and, and work too hard as they're reading the specific games. I love that. I get it now. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. That makes a lot of sense. And I think you're the first person that ever that I've ever heard um, make that statement and that difference that you you essentially want an overall hypothesis yeah. of what this full grant is. But then in the aims, as you have laid out, you can put more about the methods and, and the stuff that you have included, or perhaps like your colleague who really puts in this is the question, this aim is going to do and then you know dependent on that knowledge the knowledge progression um, builds through the second and third aim am, am i capturing that correctly you are it's so um yeah so let's just look at this so the specific aims i'm really talking about feasibility here i want to get across feasibility and and and, and i don't want them to like trip on oh another hypothesis so how does this work with the big thing and stuff like that? Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You got it. Thank you, Joe. And other, thank you. Other questions? David, this is John Repine. I'm hey, John. wondering, do you put subheadings in there? Sometimes after I read a specific games page, I go back, well, what's innovative about this? Now you have that in there, but if you have a heading, I'm just asking in a, what's innovative or the innovation, I can go back and say, oh, here's what they think is innovative or what's the impact, you know, like subheadings along the way or what's the rationale or you know, uh, just trying to break it down more. Cause sometimes yeah. I go through the specific games and then I go, what, what do they think is innovative here? And if they, and then I can go back and say, oh, here it is. They think this is innovative or, mm -hmm. Like it's nice at the end here, you have overall the proposal. Should you have that labeled significance or impact? Yeah, yeah. So um, first of all, John, uh, I, for those who don't know John, uh, John's a god in terms of grant writing. So, um, you know, and, and what, what 
what that means is that everyone can get better in terms of grant writing. Everyone. That's why I'm listening to you. Everyone, <laughs> everyone has something to learn from each other. Um, and so what I would say is that, um, is that in terms of the specific aims, you want to focus on feasibility, um, or I want to focus on feasibility in terms of the specific aims, methods, and things like that. Uh, I don't want to deal with the issue of rationale at this point. I want to deal with the issue of rationale when I get to the method section or the approach section. Uh, but I think putting something in, in terms of um, novelty and innovation is a really good idea. And I'm going to, I'm going to incorporate that in terms of, you know, uh, the, the approach that I take to these descriptor sentences here. I think I get maybe too involved in telling them how I'm going to do this, uh, maybe too involved in the feasibility. And I don't take it a notch up and say, Hey, this, you know, I can take a novel approach to this and, um, and, and, and this is, this, this enhances the excitement. In terms of your comment about impact, uh, yeah, you could label this impact. I'll show you another thing that I do in the specific games where I, in the significant section, uh, where I expand my description of the impact and I, I end the specific, I end the significant section, which I think is a pretty boring section. I end this, the, the significant section with a paragraph on, on impact, because I think that, that that's, you know, it sort of becomes a springboard for the rest of the grant. Um, but yeah, you could label this, this impact. And I think that that would be helpful. Okay, we have another question. Um, I don't know who's uh, first. Um, so shall, shall we? Yes, <laughs> this is the Xiao Wei. Uh, I am currently- Xiao Wei, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, tell us, um, tell us where are you from? Yeah, I'm, you I'm currently the T32 fellow in palliative care and aging um, in the division of uh, general internal medicine um, with uh, Dr. Jean Kuttner's grant. Um, so, I have been kind of learning uh, the grants and and while I'm kind of um, kind of putting uh, one aim to put a, a, a K grant together um, and to submit to what uh, later of this year. So I have been reading different specific aims, uh, both K grants and R grants. And I do see like across the board, uh, many of them have a very succinct and easy to understand figure to just to give you the broad picture of this, what this grant is about, the context and the background. But then I also hear some just uh, um, anecdotal comments about, oh, maybe the figure now is outdated, you know, it takes too much space. And I think mm -hmm. reviewers don't, don't like it, don't recommend it anymore. So I don't know like which, you know, to take and which side I should take on yeah. because I am great in question. that great background, question. you know, great description. So what you want to do uh, in the figure, uh, because it does take up space, is you want to ask the tough question of does it add value or is it redundant? Um, and uh, in this case, I added a figure because it added value. The, the overall goal was a little too complex to and, and hard to understand in one sentence. And as I began to pick apart that sentence, I thought, well, you know, I really need to help the reviewer here understand this a little bit better. So I put a figure in. I I I don't think I don't think a, a reviewer is ever upset gets upset with a figure that helps them understand something. I think a reviewer gets um, annoyed when it is redundant and, um, and not necessary. Um, but even then it's your space, it's not the reviewer's space that you're wasting. So, it, you know, it's, it, it, 
kind of um, it shouldn't upset the reviewer. Um, and I must say, as I've gotten older, I have become uh, a much more um, uh, tolerant reviewer. Um, in other words, I, I really look for the, the really good things in a grant and skip over the problems in a grant or the things that um, would have previously annoyed me. I, I, you know, the, the reviewers shouldn't get annoyed by reading good science and by, uh, by um, getting, a, getting a sense of how a field could be moved forward. Um, you like more reviewers like you. <laughs> I think everyone really hopes that I review their grant because it's always a good review. Um, so Chris, uh, I think you may be next. Great, yeah, thanks. I, I also just wanted to say thanks. This has been really, um, really great already. And so thanks, uh, thanks for your presentation um, and for, you know, um, disseminating this kind of information, it's really helpful. But um, I, I had a question about um, kind of uh, certain certain types of um, references and then also um, certain quotes uh, that you can use sometimes and, and how relevant those need to be. Because sometimes I get caught up where there might be a good reference or there might be a good quote. We work, I do um, stuff specifically in, the, in mental health. And um, in 2007, the director of the NIH and NIMH um, came out and said that we want to try to vaccinate against depression, but that was in 2007. Um, and, and so I, we put that into a lot of our proposals and I, I've always really liked it because it's a very impactful statement. However, it did come in, in 2007. And so I wonder about that sometimes. Yeah. Um... You know, quotes are difficult. Um, my wife loves quotes. I hate quotes. Um, and, um, and I just, you know, I just think that um, You know, I used to be a, um, a director of one of the institutes at the NIH and there were a lot of quotes that people would requote and stuff like that. Um, and, and I always thought that, you know, it, it, it's not that important what I think, it's what, what's really important is what you're thinking. And that's what I, th I think you need to get across in the grant. It's, it's not, you know, even if you're a thought leader, um, it, it, you, it, it, it's something that, 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 you've got to convince other people that your thinking is novel, is uh, going to advance the field and is going to do it in a special way. And, um, and so I could care less uh, what, um, what Insel thinks. Um, he was the director of NIMH when uh, he, you know, I, I really could care less if I'm reviewing a grant of yours, what Insel thinks. I, I know him very well. I respect him. I, you know, I, I, I think his recent book is terrible, but I, um, uh, because of what it is going to do to the NIH, but I, I think that, um, and don't quote me on that, <laughs> um, but I, um, but I, uh, I think that um, when I'm reviewing your grant, I don't care what what he thinks, I, I, I care what you think. And so I would, I, I would probably stay away from quotes. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. Van? Hi, David, this is really, really helpful. So- um, Can you introduce you? yourself because people probably don't know you. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm a system professor in the department and on the, also the Center for House AI. So I'm writing several grants now, including the grants only available for the ESI <laughs> investigators. So, so anyway, I have a question about uh, how important of the independence between the aims, right? Sometimes like in aim one, like we use a method to identify, say, in your page, uh, link RAs, right? And aim two, let's identify what's the cis effects 
of the disease associated with genetic variants in that link RNA and AMS realized validator. So I think this is super cool. And I see many grant funded in this way. But when I share my aims with others, some people said, oh, your aims are correlated with each other because AIM3 depends on what you find AIM2. So I, I, as a beginner, <laughs> I'm trying to understand what's your advice. Yeah, so um, I'll tell you the way other people review grants and then I'll tell you the way I review grants. Um, so um, uh, there are these um, like red flags that reviewers have um, and um, Two of the red flags that you have to stay away from is uh, one, the interdependence of grants, and and two, um, uh, the grant not being mechanistic um, uh, and or experimental. You know, I mean, you can be a hypothesis generating grant, but it still has to address a mechanism. Um, and and those are two death blows in a review section. Um, uh, and unfortunately, too many reviewers kind of think of that, think of that when they're um, when they're uh, reviewing a grant. <clears throat> I never get too hung up over interdependent aims um, because uh, what I sort of think um, reviewing is the creativity of the investigator uh, and the ability of the investigator to address an important topic. And if they've shown me that they are thoughtful, creative, and have uh, an accomplishment, have a series of accomplishments, I know they'll deal with the problems that are embedded in interdependent aims. In other words, um, I know that if things don't work out in AIM-1 and uh, they'll figure out how to do AIM-2 in a different way and approach AIM-3 um, uh, as a way of continuing their science. Not every reviewer, or let me say most reviewers, do not uh, approach the review process in that way. And so even I try to stay away from making um, AIMs uh, interdisciplinary, in, interdependent. Um, I, I, and, and I would recommend that you stay away from doing that. Uh, it, it ends up being a death blow to a really good grant and a really good idea. And, and you know, if you're, if you're very, very thoughtful, and this takes time, if you're very, very thoughtful, even interdependent aims can be worded in a way that they're independent. And I would recommend strongly that you do that. Got it. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> one of the other things that um, I was thinking about while I was answering some of these questions is that uh, we, we, we might want to create a little library of like outstanding grants. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've had a few grants that have been um, reviewed you know, as perfect grant, you know, one, 10, whatever the score is, 10 or one or whatever the score is. And, and there are a lot of other investigators that have had uh, that done. And um, it would be good to sort of post those grants and the critique on a website that we mm -hmm. could then uh, make accessible to uh, people writing grants. Because I've, as I said, I've learned a lot by reading other people's grants. <laughs> Uh, in terms of yeah. how uh, how to write a grant, and and it might be something that um, would be helpful to some of the people on this uh, in this uh, session. Yeah, that's a really great idea. Thank you, Xu Yi. Hi, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I'm an assistant professor at National Jewish Health. So I'm working with Dr. Lisa Meyer, and then uh, some collaboration with Dr. Ivana Yan. So. You know, so so my, my question is because my research is more like uh, doing the GWAS or doing the gene expression and then doing the metabolomic, you know, using this kind of um, target or genome-wide approach. So when I write the grain, you know, talk about, I try to find some like biomarker to differentiate like progressive saccharidose versus non-progressive saccharidose, that kind of thing. The reviewer will come back, say, 
know, they think this is more like exploratory, you know, hypothesis generating or a little risky, or they are thinking about the vision, that kind of thing. But the truth is right now, not many people really found a, a, a mechanism to find this kind of certain disease. So I don't know what would be the best way to kind of address this kind of issue, you know, because we are, I'm not going to do like bench research and knock a mouse and then testing the specific gene. Instead, I can do in the genome approach, try to find a certain type of biomarker predictor, that kind of thing. But the mm -hmm. comments from like patient, risky, exploratory, I don't know how to, how much you thought about this. Yeah. Um... Good question and a hard topic. Um, I would recommend keeping the word biomarker out of any grant. <laughs> uh, biomarker is a charged uh, term. Um, biomarker um, uh, um, has a, a very well-defined um, scope and process that's been defined by the uh, FDA. Um, uh, and, um, and there are a number of regulatory hoops you have to go through to create a biomarker. Um, and, um, and those involve uh, a lot of things that probably are not in your grant um, uh, proposal um, because they're completely regulatory and they're completely um, focused on validation, uh, repeatability, and a, a lot of things that we normally don't put in our grant. So, you know, you're really not studying a biomarker. Um, and, um, and, and this is without looking at your grant, and I'd be happy to look at your grant and, and talk with you a little bit about it. But, um, but um, I, would, I would bet that what you're studying, what you're, what you're really trying to understand are uh, indicators of specific aspects of the disease that you're studying. Um, and those indicators of specific aspects of the disease that you're studying can be put in terms of molecular phenotypes uh, that are relevant to particular clinical phenotypes uh, that um, are not uh, predictive biomarkers or are not uh, biomarkers that end up becoming, uh, that, that are useful in the clinical um, situation um, or, or are being proposed in the clinical situation. So, you know, I, I, I think you can probably revamp what you're doing by thinking about how do, what does this tell us about the molecular features of this particular disease? Or what, is, what do these molecular tags tell us about the clinical presentation of this patient population? But I would not, I, 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 you know, even though biomarkers are kind of a, a cool term to use, um, there, it, it's a very complex term to use, and I'd be careful. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, let's move on, um, and um, we can talk uh, about the significant section and the rest of the grant. But as I said, you know, from my perspective. Specific aims uh, don't don't um, shy away from spending <clears throat> a lot of time and putting a lot of effort into the specific aims. David, yeah, uh, this is Ed Janoff from Infectious hey, yeah. Disease. Hi. Um, so I agree with you about the critical nature of specific aims, and if you if you engage them in this first part, then they are willing to cut you slack in the rest. But if you make it really difficult for them to understand because that reviewer has to go to study section and explain what you did. And if they have to work too hard, you know, they're not happy. But my real question is, you know, there are those of us who have been doing this for a long time and you spent a lot of emphasis on, you know, highlighting what you've done before. But if you're a new investigator, then you may not have done that much before. Or if you're an established investigator and you're doing something totally new, you haven't done that much before in that area. So how do you how do you advise you know new investigators to address that piece? Because we know new investigators fare much less well than established investigators in funding. Yep. So um, 
First of all, I want to say that uh, I, I really appreciate Ed, you being part of this. Ed's another incredibly successful grant writer um, who um, has uh, done uh, superb work um, in understanding host defense. Um, so um, what, what I would, the way I would answer that is um, twofold. Um, one is that, um, You always want to make sure that you're not overreaching. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a good lesson in life <laughs> uh, to a certain extent. Um, and you want to make sure that you're staying within what you're capable of doing and proving to other individuals. And um, and so if you're at the point uh, early in your career where you haven't had the research accomplishments that you need for an R01, well, you should be applying for a career development award. And that career development award um, is specifically designed for individuals that are just emerging as investigators and don't yet have the, um, the accomplishments to warrant uh, an investment of an R01 or a merit or some, some type of uh, R01 equivalent. That, that's, that, that's one point that I wanna make. Um, the second, and, and I think your mentor is really important in terms of steering you toward uh, a, a, a career development award or career development lookalike award versus an R01. Um, and the second um, point that I wanna make is that I think that, um, and this is gonna be relatively controversial, I'm sure that a lot of people are gonna uh, push back on this, this second point, which is good. Um, I think that um, it's incumbent on uh, established investigators to um, to help more junior investigators be part of a bigger uh, program and demonstrate their accomplishments as part of a bigger program so that they can develop independence. So in other words, um, what I try to do is I try to make my accomplishments impart their accomplishments in the grant that they're writing so that they can promote an idea that becomes independent and self um, um, independent and, um, and, and complementary to the work that we're doing as, as a whole. So it, it sort of broadens the scope of what we're trying to do and maintains their independence at the same time, but allows them to be part of a bigger enterprise that enables them to show that they've been part of these accomplishments of the bigger enterprise. Right, and a lot of successful new R01s come out of bigger labs where they've been part of a big project that's been successful and they've had a specific role in it. So that, I don't think that's controversial. That sounds realistic. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem that, the, the reason I say it might be controversial is that I, I know that everyone wants to become independent quickly. Um, and um, sometimes being part of um, a larger group still enables you to become independent and may in fact enable you to become independent even more quickly. Yeah, and, and you know, NIH no longer requires that you are totally independent to get an R01. You can, you can actually now have either relationships with your earlier mentor or other senior investigators and you'll no longer have to be just you independent of everybody else. Right, right. Okay. Um, well, let's, in, are there any other questions before we move on to the significant section? Okay, let's move on to the significant section. I, um, I actually find this section uh, to be um, sort of 
a necessary but uninspired um, component of the grant. And maybe I don't devote enough attention uh, to this, but uh, what, what I wanna get across in the significance section is the importance of the problem, the critical barriers to progress, the ways to improve uh, knowledge. Um, I, I do put uh, preliminary results in the, uh, in the significance section as a way of demonstrating what we've done in the field. And then, as I mentioned uh, previously in responding to John Repine, I end with a paragraph focused on, on impact. So let me show you what this looks like. So this is a specific aims uh, page, this is a significance uh, page uh, from uh, an R01 that I wrote. And um, when I should say that I try to limit this to about two pages, uh, I, I, I wanna move through this kind of quickly. I wanna, I want the reviewer to move through this kind of quickly. And I want, I, I wanna do it kind of quickly because um, I wanna keep them engaged in what I'm thinking as opposed to what the field is thinking. Um, and so um, I do put this section of, um, of rigor of prior research and scientific premise in here, again, um, as a way of letting them know what the field has done and what we're going to do and how it's gonna be rigorous. Uh, I do put in um, our own data uh, in this specific aims, in the significant section, excuse me, um, as a way of letting them know that we're the experts in this field and are leading this field. Um, uh, I keep it short, I keep it user-friendly. I use bold titles to let them know which paragraphs they may wanna read and which paragraphs they may, may wanna skip through. So, you know, the bold sentences are a way of telling them what they're gonna find in that paragraph. If they don't wanna read about the MUC5B promoter and pulmonary fibrosis, they know all about that, then they don't have to. I uh, put bold um, type uh, for the figures and the, and the tables um, because uh, one reviewer might say, look, I know everything about the MUC5B um, uh, variant, but let me look at figure one. Or let, uh, let me look. Let me look at, uh, I think I also refer to a table. Um, well, I, I refer to the table in, in, in this um, paragraph here. But um, you can see how it helps the reviewer move through this kind of quickly um, and in almost an, um, a bulleted uh, format. And then I end with this impact, uh, the deliverable. Uh, I, I think about this in terms of how is this gonna change the field? So isolated genetics, epigenetics, transcriptomics, and clinical attributes have so far provided only a partial picture regarding risk and severity slash extent of IPF. We believe that the proposed comprehensive multidimensional model of IPF will one, establish the basic molecular profiles to develop novel molecular insights into disease etiology and clinical severity slash extent. Two, facilitate a strategic approach to the development of primary and secondary forms of disease prevention. And three, provide the rationale and targets here I use biomarkers, sorry, <laughs> for intervention in this fatal disease. Um, and, and really what I, I'm, I'm, I would revise this, I would say therapeutic targets for this intervention, for intervention in this fatal disease, because you know, um, this disease has no treatment. This disease, uh, well, it does have treatment, I'm, I'm not, uh, but the treatment is not effective in terms of reversing any aspect of the disease. So I want them to know that, you know, this work is gonna result in something that's going to move the field forward. And I, and I waste space or I use space strategically to get that point across to them. Okay, so what is the reviewer's response to the significant section? Uh, one, uh, that 
I know what I'm talking about, that I, you know, that I'm aware of other people in the field. I'm aware what other people have contributed. Uh, I am taking a rigorous approach to this, um, that our perspective um, to understand, understands the con acknowledges others in the field. Like, you know, I, I'm always um, kind of wary of the reviewer who wants to make sure that their paper is cited. Uh, so I over um, cite papers in the significant section as a way of making sure that if anyone reviews my grant, uh, they my proposal. Uh, by the way, a proposal is what you put into the NIH. A grant is when the uh, grant when the proposal is funded. Um, so uh, anyone who reviews my proposal will see that their paper has been cited as one of uh, the papers in in uh, the the work in the proposal that I'm I'm putting forward. Um, that I've contributed in a meaningful way to the significance of the field, um, and that my proposal will have an impact on on the field. And uh, the bottom line, though, is that I want to make sure that the reviewer is awake and alert at the end of the significant section. I don't want to put them to sleep. I want them to understand the context, and I want them to even become a stronger advocate of my work. Um, I um, let me just quickly deal with that. I'll be right back. Okay, my apologies. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that this is important. Again, you wanna make it so user-friendly that they could read the bullets, get the idea, and then read the paragraph on uh, impact and still be excited by the work. You don't want them to all of a sudden um, lose their enthusiasm for what you're trying to get across. Okay, um, I'm going to move to the innovation section because I think that, um, oh yeah, so um, I also think that ending the, um, the significant section with, with an impact paragraph, I almost think is a springboard to talking about innovation. You know, how is your work innovative? Okay. So um, innovation is, 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 um, is as I, I've said before, uh, you know, an overused term. Um, and, um, but I think, you know, when you kind of, you know, put some, some bead on it. It really is, as it relates to the research, how are you gonna shift the way people are thinking about the research? What are the novel concepts, approaches, and or interventions that are a derivative of your research? Uh, uh, and um, how um, are these um, findings gonna be applied to move the field ahead? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I've seen various approaches to the innovation section. I've seen people write innovation, the innovation section, just by identifying the four or five uh, points that they want to make and just put them in as bullets. I don't think that that's very good. I, I actually um, uh, end up devoting a whole page to the innovation section, at least. And I devote a whole page to the innovation section because not only do I want them to understand the high level um, aspect of innovation, I want them to understand what my thinking is related to that high level aspect. So let me give you a, a few examples. Uh, they're, they're fairly audacious examples of, of um, innovation, but there are things that I wrote and things that were re reviewed relatively well. 
So, you know, I'll start off a paragraph by saying our proposed research has the potential of changing our basic concepts about asthma. And this is when, uh, you know, I was moving the field forward about thinking about epigenetic marks in asthma and how epigenetic marks um, really are uh, based on in utero um, aspects of um, exposures and how those in utero aspects of uh, exposures alter fundamental epigenetic marks and move individuals toward a Th2 immune um, uh, state. And so um, I, I thought that, that it was really important uh, to talk about you know, how asthma develops and how we were gonna, uh, by, in, by, by studying epigenetic marks, advance the field of, of this, this very confusing field of asthma. Second is our proposed research in epigenetics has the potential to transform asthma therapy from palliative to preventive and they alter our recommendations for pregnant women throughout the world. Wow, that's pretty big. You know, uh, that, that's, that would be an innovation. Uh, that would be a, a, a radical change in the field um, and uh, would uh, substantially um, uh, alter the way in which we approach asthma because all of a sudden we're thinking about it uh, as a way of, of of preventing the disease from ever occurring. Third is our proposed research in asthma epigenetics may prove important in other immune and autoimmune diseases, especially those that are increasing in prevalence and severity in developed countries. And here I'm making the, the, the um, point that you know, these epigenetic changes and these skewing toward a Th2 phenotype may not only underlie the development of asthma, but it might also be responsible for the epidemic we're seeing in type one diabetes and in Crohn's disease, as well as multiple sclerosis and atopic dermatitis, all diseases that are increasing in developed countries uh, and are increasing and are part of a, a TH2 response. Um, and then lastly, I say uh, there are several, uh, several unique aspects of our project. And I talk about them in terms of like what we're, what we're doing that is um, methodologically novel at that point in time when we were doing it. Now it's, now it's not method, methodologically novel, but, but that's part of innovation is letting them know how this is, is, is really different than what's going on in the rest of the field. So the reviewer's response uh, to innovation, I think that you want them to just get more excited about the work. You know, you want them to um, understand how your work uh, creates a new future for, for the field that you're studying and uh, that they like the way you and your colleagues are thinking about the work. I think the bottom line for the innovation section is be bold. Uh, the reviewer needs to know you're on the cutting edge of your chosen field and, and think about the innovation section as a way of, of, of promoting that. Um, um, don't be afraid to be bold. Don't be afraid to, um, to, to sort of think about this in, um, you know, sort of you know, the future, imagine the future if these, if these findings, uh, if, this, if this proposal was successful. One of the big problems with NIH grants, uh, by the way that they're written and the, and the way I'm telling you to write this is fundamentally they're incremental. Um, uh, the innovation section should not be incremental. If the innovation section is in, incremental, the reviewer will say, so what? The, the innovation section has to, has to be earth-shaking. It has to, you know, it has to make it abundantly clear that, uh, that, that you're in this to, to really address that unmet need, clinical, biological, public health unmet need, in a unique way and, 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 and the world is gonna change as a result of it. 
Okay, before we get to the approach section, let me just pause there and ask uh, whether there are questions or comments. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the approach section. Sorry, may yeah. I interrupt and ask a question? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, what if your ideas go against the grain of what's established in the literature? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, in fact, those are the grants that I like to write the best. Um, so, um, you have to be respectful of the literature. You have to be understanding of the literature. You have to make it clear how um, the liter how um, uh, things have moved in a direction, but they haven't really addressed a fundamental problem. And uh, and that your work. Uh, and orthogonal thinking is going to be able to address this problem in a unique way. And I think those grants, uh, oftentimes, if they're well supported by preliminary data for this orthogonal thinking, uh, will do very well in the review process. In fact, the reviewers and the agencies want to fund that because they're very frustrated with the field that hasn't made enough progress but you have to be respectful and thoughtful about how you are um, addressing the, the current thinking. You can't just diss the current thinking and, 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 and promote your own idea. Thank you. I, I have a question, sorry, Nancy uh, Hadley Miller, ortho. Uh, I noticed the bot. You said no biomarkers, but I noticed. I think it was the bottom of your significance page. <laughs> yeah, you used the term biomarker. I know that was that was a mistake. I mean, you okay. know, like I said, all of all of these grants are really not. You know, none of these grants are perfect, right? And um, and you just have to be very careful. You just have to be like really, really careful about what you write in a grant. That's why they take so long to write. Um, I, I shouldn't have written biomarkers there. I should have written um, innovative therapeutic approaches um, to this disease that doesn't have a treatment, an effective treatment. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for pointing that out. Okay, um, let's talk about the approach. Um, so um, I think, I, again, this is very formulaic and I hate to be so sort of structured in terms of the approach here, in terms of what I do, but um, I view grants as relatively formulaic. So in the approach, I start off with a paragraph and that paragraph gives them the overall strategy that I'm taking uh, to this problem, um, uh, you know, in terms of the experimental strategy. Uh, I uh, make it clear that uh, there is a rigorous approach to this ex experimental design. And uh, then I'll separate my methods into general methods. If there are general methods that go across several aims. I'll, I'll get all of those general methods out there. And then I will talk about the methods that are relevant to each one of the specific aims. And if necessary, refer to the general methods. And then I include a paragraph on problems and alternative approaches. Um, and, um, and let me just show you a couple of examples. Um, Okay, so this was an incredibly complex project. And, um, and I thought that this project really required um, that I uh, start with an overview and tell them what I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to do it and how it relates to the hypothesis and how the aims relate to the hypothesis. And 
sort of that's how I move through the overview paragraph and it shouldn't be more than a half a page. But in this particular case, this was so complex that I really needed another series of figures to let them know about what I was doing with these diversity out out outbred uh, mice how I was exposing them uh, to bleomycin or not exposing them, the different outcomes that I was looking at, how I was going to analyze and process those outcomes in terms of epigenetic marks and, um, and uh, the kinship and the haplotype inference that we were doing, what that product of the DO mice was gonna be uh, because this, was a big endeavor, 900 mice that we were gonna phenotype. And uh, we were gonna end up with QTLs, uh, expression QTLs for bleomycin that we were gonna end up um, understanding how MUC5B related to those expression QTLs. And then we were gonna take all of that knowledge. And, and here's where I, you know, as an experienced investigator, I get to like have a little bit of interdependence of aims. Uh, we were going to take all of that knowledge that we were going to gain from these mice and we were going to apply it to our patient population of patients with pulmonary fibrosis to see whether that provided insight into this disease that, um, that people are trying to understand and that we have a unique viewpoint of given our interest in uh, this MUC5, this dominant risk factor for pulmonary fibrosis, MUC5B. So you can see how this is a very, very complex series of uh, interrelated, not interrelated, a complex series of, of, of studies or aims that, um, that uh, I wanted to show how the knowledge flowed across uh, the different aims. And, and that's what I got um, from the, um, I'm sorry, uh, let's see. So in this overview, I remind the reviewer about the proposal. I, I reiterate that first sentence, the overall goal and the hypothesis. Um, secondly, I tell the reviewer how it all fits together after the hypothesis. I want this, this is to, to show them that these aims are a body of knowledge that I'm creating, even though they're in the relatively independent. I wanna show the reviewer how I'm gonna be able to do this, um, when it, especially when it's complex. And again, that's, that's all in this overview uh, section. Here's another example of a figure in an overview section uh, that I had in a relatively large grant where we had five aims and we were uh, uh, had various populations. I want to show them how these aims relate to each other and how we're moving through a derivation, confirmation, and a validation phase. Here's uh, even a more complex um, study where we have three different I'm sorry, four different aims. It started with three different aims. The reviewers recommended a fourth aim and we put the fourth aim in. The first aim is a single nuclear RNA-seq of three different types of usual interstitial pneumonia, IPF, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial lung disease. We'll end up with a variety of um, gene targets um, and cell types uh, that are relevant to MUC5B induced usual interstitial pneumonia. We're doing a tax seek, so we'll understand how chromatin relates to this MUC5B associated usual, usual interstitial pneumonia. Uh, we'll integrate those findings uh, between RNA seq and a tax seq, and then we'll see how this relates to the heterogeneity of. Uh, different types of usual interstitial pneumonia. These are just different forms of pulmonary fibrosis and how it relates to the in vitro biology. Uh, again, all in one picture and that picture appears in the overview section. 
The second paragraph in uh, the approach section is the rigorous experimental design and relevant biological variables. And I go through this um, as a way of satisfying the NIH criteria. And I just put a paragraph in there that, that talks about all that stuff. Um, and then, as I said, I go through general methods and those general methods might uh, focus on the study population and uh, uh, our ability to look at the common variants, our ability to do RNA-seq and our ability to manage data and analyze data. And the, these, you could see how these would be common to all of the specific aims in, in a particular grant. And then when I write the specific aims, Again, it's very, very formulaic. I start with a paragraph that talks about the rationale. And in that rationale, I'll oftentimes refer to some of our own work or work of our collaborators. I'll then talk about the comparison that we're making, you know, sort of like walk them through what we're thinking we're going to find and how we're going to look at the data uniquely. And I'll make sure to address the issue of power because power ends up being important in every single uh, experiment that you end up doing. Um, and and I, I address the issue of power very directly, sometimes not extensively, but very directly at least. <clears throat> and then I talk about the anticipated outcome and the alternative approaches. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, this paragraph I don't like very much um, because, you know, as an experienced investigator, as an established investigator, uh, I think that I've proven that, you know, if things don't work out the way that they're supposed to work out, uh, creative enough and thoughtful enough that I'm not going to just stop going to work. I'm going to continue to think about this and think about different approaches to take. And so I, I, I don't view this as particularly um, uh, relevant to the science that we're um, proposing, but I found when I don't put this paragraph in, it really annoys some reviewers. So I, I put the paragraph in and I, and I think you should put the paragraph in. So at the end of the approach section, what I want reviewers to know is that the approach that we're taking makes sense. It inspires, I want them uh, to be uh, confident that I'm gonna be able to complete the studies uh, either myself or with collaborators that we're using state-of-the-art methods and that we've con considered alternative approaches, but uh, think that the approach that we're taking is important. And bottom line is that I want the reviewer to believe that I can do it uh, and that it's grounded in reality and that I've engaged experts in the field that could help us even do it better. So um, I see that we only have one minute left. So I want to just uh, give you one uh, important um, uh, summary piece of advice here. Um, I think it's important to read um, someone else's funded proposal, um, um, especially proposals that have been reviewed exceedingly well. And um, I'm you know, I'm, I'm helping the School of Medicine develop this program for physician scientists and pipeline for physician scientists. And I think we're going to just find a place and to post really outstanding grants. Um, and maybe I'll solicit some from um, the people on this call and from other individuals. Um, but I think, you know, having a, a library of really outstanding grants that you can go to to look at to see how uh, people have dealt with these issues in different ways would be helpful for investigators. Um, second is to develop a mentorship committee of established investigators and include letters of support when necessary. And third, and this is the most important, is know who your program officer is going to be and, and engage them early in the process. Send them your specific aims after you've worked on them. Listen to them carefully in terms of uh, their thoughts about your specific aims. 
uh, and, um, and engage them as a colleague because they're going to be your strongest advocate after your grant gets reviewed to see whether your grant will be funded, to try to figure out whether your grant will be funded. So I think those are the points I wanted to get across. I, um, I apologize for going a little too long in terms of this proposal and apologize for the interruption, um, but uh, does anyone have any um, questions they wanna ask? Or comments that you wanna make? Uh, I have a quick question. My name's Jennifer and I'm uh, in the Department of Pediatrics, uh, just working my way through a career development grant. Um, uh, my question is, you mentioned not uh, stating your hypotheses in the specific aims. Would you do so, um, you know, would you state specific hypotheses for each specific aim once you get to the, um, you know, research methods section? Again, I tend not to. Uh, it's not, it, 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 you know, it's, it's not wrong to do that. It's, um, but you have to ask the question of, um, why are you doing that? Uh, why is it, how does it help the reviewer? And if it helps the reviewer, uh, certainly, certainly include it. I'm not saying you shouldn't. Um, I'm saying I don't. <laughs> um, and, uh, but um, if, it, if you think it helps the reviewer walk through your thinking, definitely include it. The rationale section is more important than a hypothesis in that, in, in that specific aim. The rationale will clue the reviewer into what you're thinking. And, and the other aspect that I wanted to, to get across is that you may want to just ask, a, you know, make it clear to the reviewer what series of questions you're answering in that specific aim. That's what David Bentley would do. Great, thank you. Chris, did you have a question? I do. Yes, thank you. Um, and then uh, again, for um, for for young investor investigators, um, I was wondering if you could just like give a really quick briefing on like how to properly engage with the program officer and how not to like upset them with um, with too much communication or something like that. Yeah, great question. So um, when I was at your stage um, a month before I. Um, I put in my uh, K award. I sent my specific aims to a guy named George Melanzac at NIEHS. And uh, George was the program officer for the K awards there. And um, uh, he called me up right after I sent it to him and he read and um, he told me that this was the worst specific aims he's ever read. And uh, he told me why it was the worst specific aims he's ever read. And he told me what I needed to do to make it much better. And I listened to him. And, um, and just that res mutual respect for each other and that, mute, that engagement. He's become a lifelong friend of mine, actually. And um, uh, that engagement was absolutely critical to making the grant much better. And it got funded the first time around. Um, but it never would have gotten funded had I not listened to George and had I not thought more deeply about what I was proposing and how I could make that clear to the reviewer. So I would say, you know, once or twice before your grant goes in, um, I think um, uh, an email with your specific aims followed up by a phone call uh, would not annoy any program officer. These program officers are paid by your taxes, so they work for you. Um, and um, But treat them as colleagues and treat them with respect. They all have either a PhD or an MD after their name. And uh, they're all very, very interested in promoting science. Yeah, that, that's great. That's very helpful. And then also um, for proposals that are not funded, um, when when would it be appropriate yeah. to engage? Perfect. With them? After you've gotten the critique back and thought about it and thought about your responses, um, it would be good to um, like send us a short summary of what you would do in response to the critique because you're thinking about a resubmission and ask them whether, you, whether you're on target or not um, and, and whether you, 
they think that the approaches that you're taking make sense. I, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I have a lot of friends at the NIH and I have a lot of friends at the NIH because I treat them with extraordinary respect and I engage them in the grant writing process and, and in the resubmission process. Yeah, yeah, that's great, thank you. Other questions that you might have? I know we're a few minutes over. <laughs> 